3,000 miles from Britain's coast, the Union Jack floats proudly in the sunshine over Canada, whose wheat has won a worldwide reputation. Let us go to Canada and see how she produces such vast quantities of fine wheat. Let us go as other sons of Britain have gone so many times before to this young country. Though the long stretch of Atlantic lies between, she is bound to us by ties as strong as those that bind brother to brother. Out from Liverpool, while the gals cry in our ears, with the salt taste of the ocean in our mouths. Our island home fades into the sea. Across 3,000 miles of grey Atlantic, days and nights of quiet seas, of heaving, tossing water, of ocean madness and tranquility. We leave the mother of half the rolling earth for the land beyond the setting sun. They that go down to the sea in ships never relax vigilance. But for the passengers, life on board is a round of carefree pleasure. Lazier spirits soak in sunshine and salt air or watch the grain ships from Canada carrying wheat to British markets. They appear from the setting sun to plow back over our trail. Our first sight of Canada. Father Point, at the entrance to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, watches the passing ships of many nations. The pilot boat puts out from shore. Trained St. Lawrence River pilots come aboard to direct the steering of our ship. A thousand miles of ocean lie behind us. Ahead lie a thousand miles of river as we sail up the broad St. Lawrence. On these shores, life is lived with the slow tranquility of older days. Here, simple fisher folk and tillers of the soil watch the busy commerce of the river with unenvious eyes. See the grain boats on their way to distant ports and busy markets, to the rush and bustle of modern life. In these quaint communities, the people live as their grandfathers did. On quiet Sundays, church bells call the faithful to prayer. Peace and contentment mark their ways. Canadian history marches up the St. Lawrence once sailed by the great explorers. The famous Chateau Frontenac towers over the steep winding streets of old Quebec, haunted by the names of Marquette, Champlain, and La Salle, the only walled city on the continent north of Mexico. We follow the winding river beneath the Quebec Bridge, the longest cantilever bridge in the world, on through the province of two languages where Frenchman and Englishman 
live side by side under the same flag in the cradle of North American civilization. On to Montreal, the largest inland ocean port in the world, a thousand miles from the sea, where flags of many nations flutter from the masts of ships riding at anchor in her harbor. Here the grain boats loaded with wheat from the Canadian prairies end their voyage through the Great Lakes. Their precious cargo flows into the giant elevators and out again into the holds of larger ships who will carry the prairie gold on the last lap of its journey to become British bread. Montreal is a city of contrasts. She is French and English, a city of religion and gay nightlife, of bustling waterfront, of commerce and trade, of walled seminaries and cloistered convents. Ancient buildings huddle beneath the shadow of her skyscrapers. Her charm is continental, her spirit aggressive. Built on an island, Montreal completely encircles a mountain. An old city in a young country, she is as modern as a new song. When the snow blankets the countryside and tree boughs crackle with the cold, Canadians desert their warm firesides for the challenge of the white outdoors. They take their winter like a tonic. Bright sunshine and clear, crisp air are better than any medicine known. Canada's wintertime is Canada's playtime. There are plenty of thrills and spills when it's fair and cold. Transcontinental Railways, the Canadian National and the Canadian Pacific, carries the traveler from eastern Canada to Winnipeg, gateway to the west and grain market for the nation. Our train journey begins at Montreal. We bid adieu to the province of Quebec and in steel coaches pulled by the most modern of locomotives, start on our long journey across Ontario to Manitoba, 1,400 miles to the granary of Canada. We follow the path of the sun into the west as the early settlers did not so many years ago. Then all their worldly possessions were transported in covered wagons as they faced the setting sun to conquer a new land. Today, because of their courage and fortitude, we travel in comfort undreamed of by them. The modern transcontinental train is a hotel on wheels. Gone are the covered wagon days, the days of peril and hardship. The path of today's traveler is a smooth one. Two nights and a day, a train will be our home. Luxurious dining cars cater to our needs while the rugged scenery of the North Country flashes past our windows. When night falls, the snowy white linen of our berths invites us to sleep, knowing that each mile carries us nearer to our goal, the wheat fields of Western Canada. The train winds around the shores of Lake Superior. North of us lies Canada's mineral empire, whose gold mines have placed her third among the gold-producing nations. But the gold we seek is another kind, 
the living gold of the prairies which flows to Winnipeg, center of the wheat industry. Little more than 60 years ago, this thriving western city was a frontier outpost. Today she is queen city of the plains, and wheat sold in Winnipeg is shipped around the world. A grain exchange is the trading center of the wheat lands which stretch over three provinces, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta. 35,000 square miles of fertile soil, of sunshine and warm Chinook winds. The mighty range of the Rocky Mountains forms the western barrier. Beyond lies Vancouver, gateway to the Orient. Canada's Rocky Mountains form a weather boundary which intensifies the winter cold and summer heat on the prairies. This great alpine range runs from north to south and marks the extreme western edge of the plains. Appropriately called the roof garden of the world, it is 50 Switzerlands rolled into one. Snow crested peaks rise thousands of feet. Skyline trails lead beside foaming torrents, around deep canyons, past jeweled lakes and through the hush of spruce forests. Westward, the trails lead down to Vancouver, nestled on the west coast overlooking the Blue Pacific. From her harbor, grain boats sail for the Orient or carry their golden freight south to the Panama Canal, then east to the British Isles. Some idea of the area of the wheat provinces where wheat is grown within 700 miles of the Arctic Circle may be gained by a comparison with the area of the British Isles which roughly is 120,000 square miles. Manitoba is over 240,000. Saskatchewan over 250,000. Alberta over 255,000. Making a grand total of more than 753,000 square miles. The breadbasket of Canada. Let us leave Winnipeg for a closer view of the bald-headed prairie. The whistle of our train carries far over fields of rippling grain, over golden acres of stooped wheat. Early Scottish settlers planted the first wheat seeds on these plains. Today, prairie towns dot the landscape, and great trains rumble over the trails of the early pioneers. Tall grain elevators rear against the distant skyline. North, south, east, and west stretches the golden glory of the grain. of the farmers are comfortable and modern. Though far from any city, motor cars have replaced the old horse buggies and the wireless brings them the daily news of the world. The western farmer of today is in step with the progress of the times. His barns house fine livestock. In many sections of the country, the farms are completely motorized and giant tractors are used instead of the teams of sturdy horses. Let us stop for a chat with some of these farmers of Canada. Are you a Canadian, Mr. Edwards? Well, I'm a Canadian citizen. I was born in Birmingham, England. Until the war, I was a silversmith. I worked at Elkington. Do you ever feel homesick? Oh, no, I don't get homesick. There's lots of Englishmen on the farms in Canada. We don't have time to get homesick. We'll drop in on Mr. Hosford. You're from Ireland, aren't you? Yes, I was born in Ireland. Came to Canada 30 years ago. You grow wheat? Yes, sir. When you plant your wheat, do you ever think of it being shipped to Ireland to make bread for your friends? Yes, I often think of it in that way. It serves as a link with the old land, and I feel sure they will never starve. Let's visit Mr. Rennie. Were you born in Canada? No, sir. I was born in Scotland, in Aberdeenshire. I came out to this country with my parents a good many years ago. 
then you are used to our Canadian winters. Decidedly, we uh, soon get climatized to the winter in Canada, and we, as, as people living here, enjoy them. And we find it's a great benefit to the, the crops, especially in the growing of wheat, the, where the excessive frost in the ground helps to make a harder grade of wheat, make better bread flour. A cross-section of the ground illustrates Mr. Rennie's point about the Canadian winters and their beneficial effect on wheat. In the fall, after the crops are harvested, the soil is ploughed. Late autumn rains sweep across the brown earth, soaking it with moisture. Then comes the intense cold and the ground slowly freezes to a depth of six feet. Snow covers the prairies. In winter reigns over a white world. For five months, the rolling plains lie in winter's icy grip. But as the spring sun grows stronger and warm winds blow from over the mountains, the snow melts. Sunshine and water penetrate the hard ground. The top soil becomes soft and warm. Soon it is ready to receive the seed. Once the seed is planted, earth and sun combine to bring the life germ of the wheat to fruition. Swiftly it grows, sending the tendrils of its roots in search of the moisture in the slowly thawing ground beneath. The tender young shoot appears green and lush above the dark soil. Spring changes to summer, and the roots grow down to a depth of about five feet, where the moisture feeds them. This assures a quality of hard wheat with a highly elastic gluten which makes a bread both nourishing and easily digestible. Most wheat lands are ploughed in the fall. Back and forth over 35,000 square miles, man, beast and machine drive steadily on. The sharp knives of the plough cut the soil into straight black furrows. Preparing the land requires courage and stamina. For some there is loneliness in the plains stretching as far as the eye can see, where man is but a moving speck. But the men of the prairies love the rolling land, and the scent of the new turned earth smells sweeter to them than the dust of great cities. of the soil is resumed. Day by day, as the rays of the sun increase in strength, more acres are made ready. From sun up until sundown, the ground is broken by the disc and harrow. These Canadian wheat farmers are tireless workers, for on their shoulders rests the responsibility of providing bread to feed millions. Next to rice, wheat is used more than any grain in the world. It is highly nutritious and contains more protein with slightly less starch than corn. One of the oldest known foods, its origin dates far back into prehistoric times. the soil is ready. The seed is loaded into the cedar and over thousands of acres the germ of life is dropped into the waiting earth to provide man with food. Day follows day, the prairie sun rides high. In three months the tiny seed becomes a giant. Wave upon wave of tawny gold sweeps to the horizon in unbroken glory. Literally steeped in sunshine as the wheat takes on the color of the sun, it absorbs energy-building elements so necessary to life. Each head of wheat contains 50 or more kernels. These kernels are the true prairie gold. Fifty or 
them are kernels. These kernels are the true prairie gold. From sun, earth, wind and rain, they bring nature's health to men. And now it is the time for the golden harvest to be gathered. Once more, man and beast cross and recross the familiar acres. Swath after swath of tall grain is mown down by the massive binder. Throughout the length and breadth of the land, the wheat is cut, stooped, and loaded. Long days of maturing under the penetrating sun of the fertile prairies are ended. Harvest time is a busy season on the sun-drenched Canadian plains. As in biblical days, the wheat must be separated from the chaff. But the modern threshing of the western farmer is a far cry from the laborious methods of the early Hebrew or ancient Egyptian who threshed his wheat on the banks of the Nile. Power is utilized on the wheat lands of today. North, east, south and west, millions of bushels of wheat, a steady stream of gold pours from the threshing machines of Canada. of power to the farms has revolutionized harvesting methods. Many modern inventions have reduced the heavy labor of harvesting. There are machines which eliminate stooking by picking up the cut grain where it has fallen and threshing it as they go along. There are giant machines or combines which cut the grain as well so that the entire operation is completed at one time. The straw left on the fields adds fiber to the soil and also serves as fertilizer. piles up a mountain of prairie gold. It flows to distant markets by three main routes, west of Vancouver and the Pacific. North to Churchill, the new port on Hudson's Bay. South to Winnipeg, gateway to Canada's eastern ports. Wheat from the sun-drenched Canadian prairies, wheat to make British bread. Prairie towns are dominated by the tall elevators to which the farmer brings his harvest. Each wagon load is weighed and graded at the local elevator. From the elevators through jointed metal chutes, the grain pours into waiting cars ready to start its long journey from the soil. Day and night trains rumble across the wheatlands. Some locomotives draw as many as 80 cars, each with its load of harvest wheat. Government grain inspectors take samples of the wheat by jabbing long poles through each carload. Small compartments spaced along the poles catch kernels of the grain across the entire width of the car. These are tagged and sent to the laboratory for grading. The examination is rigid and no car receives a rating until the quality of its load has been fully determined. 
Thus, the buyer of wheat receives the exact kind he desires. The cars are then sorted according to their destination by coasting down a slight grade known as the hump. Then they are unloaded into the giant grain terminals of the twin ports of Lake Superior, Fort William and Port Arthur. Here it is held until the arrival of the lake boats. Millions of bushels of golden grain gleam for the last time in the brilliant western sunshine. Then the hatches are battened down and the loaded boats head out across Lake Superior. From the western ports of Lake Superior, the grain trail leads through the Sioux Canal, past Sioux Saint Marie, across Lake Huron to Windsor, across Lake Erie and through the Welland Canal into Lake Ontario, the last of the Great Lakes. Big boats and little boats ply the grain route. Largest of them all, the steamship Le Moyne, has a capacity of 550,000 bushels, representing the harvest from 51 square miles. As she steams away from land, the sun sinks behind the sleeping giant of Indian legend. We sail back into the east. We bid adieu to the granary of Canada. From Lake Superior, we approach the first canal on the grain route, the famous Sault Ste. Marie Canal, containing one of the largest locks in the world, 900 by 60 feet. Ten minutes later, the heavy grain boat is lowered 19 feet to the level of St. Mary's River and Lake Huron. Out past Windsor Harbor, we sail the busiest waterway in the world, great inland lake and river route to the sea, busier than the Suez Canal, busier than the Panama Canal, from early spring to late fall, a steady stream of vessels pass both ways over the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Water Lane. On across Lake Erie into the Niagara district of Ontario, where the heady scent of ripe fruit is wafted to us from the orchards. Through the Welland Canal, which cuts across the peninsula, ten miles from the roaring, tumbling waters of Niagara Falls, one of the scenic wonders of the world, the waters plunge 165 feet into a broiling swirl of rapids and whirlpools through a rocky gorge to Lake Ontario. Adventurous spirits book passage on the tiny Maid of the Mist for a closer view of the walls of mad white water. At one time, the falls formed a formidable obstacle to shipping and freight had to be transported overland to the upper levels. The mighty father of waters defied conquest by man until the construction of the first Welland Canal. Rebuilt four times, this amazing engineering feat is 25 miles long and is crossed by 20 railway and highway bridges. The boats go through eight locks with giant steel gates and are lowered 325 feet to Lake Ontario. These tremendous locks can be completely filled and emptied in less than eight minutes. They are large enough to accommodate any ship afloat except the largest passenger liners and warships. Three of the locks have twin flights to provide simultaneous passage for up and downbound traffic. Eastward we steam over the waters of Lake Ontario, where the towers of Toronto cut across the sky. In the capital of Ontario, her parliament buildings look over a beehive of industry, of agricultural, manufacturing and mining activities. On her outskirts is held the Canadian National Exhibition, the largest annual exposition in the world. Here also is held the Royal Winter Fair. East and West meet on common ground in the Colosseum, whose ten square acres are dedicated to the showing of livestock, of aristocrats of the horse world, of cattle from the finest herds in the Dominion. Though only
only 100 years old, Toronto is a center of commerce. From tall buildings overlooking busy streets may be seen the grain boats crossing Lake Ontario towards the entrance of the St. Lawrence River. Once Indians shot the St. Lawrence Rapids in frail birch bark canoes. Today, passenger boats carry thrill seekers through the seething waters. But the heavily loaded grain boats pass through a long series of quiet canals running parallel to the angry river. On through the last canal, through the last locks on the grain route, on into the harbor of Montreal. The lake boats unload their precious cargo in Montreal's giant elevators. It flows again into the holds of ships that will carry it 3,000 miles across the sea. Montreal is hidden by the river's curve. On past the ramparts of old Quebec. On down the St. Lawrence. Across the broad Atlantic to the home ports of Britain. Once more the ship's hatches are opened. Once more the grain gleams in the light, golden with imprisoned sunshine. There is a smell of the prairies in the English air, of hot sun and Chinook winds, as the wheat pours from the holds of ships and is transferred into the good strains of Britain. To all parts of England, to Scotland, to Wales and Ireland, the trains carry the grain through the countryside. The golden stream pours into the mills, hard kernels of health to be ground into flour for British bread. The secret of good bread lies in the wheat from which it is made. Good bread is rich in calcium, protein and vitamins. Good bread is nourishing. Canadian hard wheat from the sun-drenched prairies of Canada contains the life-giving qualities of the sun. Ground into flour and baked by expert British bakers, it carries sunshine and health to the tables of the British Isles. Wheat grown on the plains of Canada brings sunshine from across the seas, from the land beyond the sunset. Thank you.